Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and uh, blessed Sabbath, and welcome once again to God's Cathedral in time. It's holy and blessed Sabbath day. And as we come before you this morning, once again, we want to do what we do every week, which is to lift up Jesus as the only Savior of the world. And as we begin this morning, want to once again um, give us a Sabbath nugget as we usually do because we recognize that there are a lot of you that are on the phone on the uh, uh, Facebook or wherever you might be listening that you may not have come to a conviction of God's Sabbath and hopefully uh, beyond the Sabbath nugget that I'll share now that the message today would bring you into a better understanding of why we not only come together and, and worship on Sabbath and preach about the Sabbath, but how important it is in your life. In the book of uh, Acts, in the 18th chapter, as we've been looking at in the past several weeks, we looked at the fact that Paul in his ministry was uh, continually, continually honoring God's Sabbath day. And here it continues again. And in Acts chapter 18 and verse 4, the Bible tells us, um, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both the Jews and the Greeks, and talking about persuading them, about the fact that the Messiah had come and that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. With that said, let us have a word of prayer as we begin today's message. Father, we thank you once again for your great love and mercy towards us. Thank you for bringing us safely through another week and to this your holy and blessed Sabbath day. This become, we want to give you thanks for knowing from eternity that we would need this time of rest to come apart from the cares and the challenges of the world and to just rest within you. To find peace, dear Father, with our friends, our, our, our neighbors, and yes, most importantly, with you, our Creator. And I pray that today that that would in fact be the experience with each and every one of us as we share this morning. Be with your man's servant, dear Father, inspire my mind and give me the words to speak. And as a result of this meeting, may some soul be drawn closer to thee. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen and amen. amen. This morning, it's um, every week it's a special message. And this morning, I pray that all of you that are, are, are listening, that you would pay special attention to what is being said, as you ought to every week anyway. But I think in a very special way today, there is a lot that is uh, going on in the world, and people are confused, and people are becoming disenchanted with life, and People seem to have nowhere where to turn or what to do. And I always want to thank the, the politicians and others that they're doing whatever they're doing to try to, to help suffering humanity. And there are those that are doing that. They're the wicked ones, of course, that are trying to destroy and to harm humanity. But there are always those that are seeking to help and I thank God for those but I want to let you know that what is going on in our world today that the only solution is Jesus Christ you see my dear brothers and sisters in the book of Daniel which I'll focus in on briefly this morning the book of Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 12 Daniel declares, beginning in verse 1, talking about 
the time in which we live. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And at that time shall Michael, talking about Jesus, stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, even though there was a nation, even to that same time. But praise God. Praise God, he not only tells us of the trouble that we are in and the trouble that is coming upon the world, but he gives us the solution. The verse continues. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. I want to put what Daniel has just said in the context of where we are today from a secular perspective, but then I'm going to also show it to you more in the Word of God. I read a book several years ago. It was published in the year, I think, around 1990. And the book is entitled, Keys to This Blood. And the basic premise of the book is that there were three, there were three powers that are vying for domination of the world. And those three powers were communism, Capitalism, which we have here in the West and most of the other countries practice it in different forms. But then the third player is what amazed me because the book declared that the third player is Catholicism, Romanism. And in the very introduction of the book, the author lays out the scenario where we are today. Now, he wasn't talking from a biblical perspective. He was talking by what he knew because he was an advisor to the, to the Pope and high, very high up in the Roman hierarchy. He was a Jesuit priest. His name was Malachi Martin. And he lays out the scenario in his book. And as I read these few statements, I want you to tell me if this man knew what he was talking about. He says, willing or not, ready or not, we are all involved in an all out, no holds barred, three way world competition. I just told you what those three are. Most of us are not competitors, however, However, we are all stakes. In other words, we've been used. He continues, for the competition is about who will establish the first one world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. Of course, Nimrod tried in Babylon, and I'll try to make a connection today, but he failed. And as I would share with you today that the Babylon of our time is well on its way trying to accomplish this, to establish the one world religion, one world order that ever existed. But my Bible tells me that he too would fail. Would fail. Continuing from this secular perspective, bear with me. It is about who will hold and yield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community, over the entire six billion people expected by demographers to inhabit the earth by the early in the third millennia. In other words, what the writer is saying, based on his inside knowledge of what is taking place, is that there is a plan to set up a one world order, that there are three competitors in that plan. Capitalism, a system of government, as we know here in the West. Catholicism, which was in the East and, and still exists to some degree. And Catholicism, the Roman church state entity. 
bear with me, please. Amen. The competition is all out because now that it has started, there is no way that it could be reversed. No holds barred, but once the uh, competition has been decided, now listen to this. Put your thinking caps on where we are today. No holds barred because once the competition has been decided, the world and all that in it is, all our way of life as individuals and as citizens of the nation, our families, our jobs, our trade and commerce and our money, our educational systems and our religions and our cultures, even our badges of national identity, which most of us have always taken for granted, all, all of them will have been powerfully and radically altered forever. Is the world in which we're living in today altered from what we've been used to? I want you to know there's no turning back. Oh, there is no turning back to a year ago, February or March. Amen. This is not accidental, brothers and sisters. In the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, God's servant, Paul, warns us. He says, he says that we ought to put on the full armor of God. But why, Paul? But why? Paul is talking about what we're dealing with, which is what I've just read to you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want you to know this morning that the aim of the enemy of our souls has always been to deface the image of God in man. He hates God and he knows that man is God's greatest creation, created in God's image, and it has always been his purpose to deface the image of God in man. I want you to know this morning that what we're going through in this country and around the world, that it is the enemy at work attempting to do exactly what he has always done. And the Bible tells us that he works through deception. That's why Jesus, when the disciples asked him what would be the signs of the end times, he told them four times. He talked more about deception than he talked about anything else when they asked him about the signs. But continuing, continuing, it says, no one can be exempted from its effects. No sector of our lives will remain untouched. Do you think this man know what he's talking about? He was talking about, are you experiencing it today? But we'll go to God's word in a little bit and see where God tells us exactly what is happening, but more importantly, but more importantly, share with us what he wants us to do. Amen? Amen? It says, no sector of our lives will remain untouched. The competition began and continues as a three-way affair because that is the number of rivals with sufficient resources to establish and maintain a dual world order. Bear with me, all right? Nobody who is acquainted with the plans of these three rivals has any doubt but that only one only one will win. Well, my Bible already has told me who is the one that will win before the one that actually wins, ultimately. But in context of this conversation, I will share with you what the Bible tells us he will win and he will reign for a little while before Jesus comes, all right? Each expects the other to be overwhelmed and to we swallowed up in the coming maelstrom of change. That being the case, it would appear inescapable that their, competition, that their competition will end up in a confrontation. 
In other words, in this fight for world domination, and bear with me, I'm getting to the word, I'm getting to the word of God. I'm just showing you what's happening in the secular world. He says we're going to end up in competition, and that's exactly what the Bible tells us, and we'll take a quick look at that uh, uh, later on, all right? That that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, remember the three, and I hope you put your thinking caps on. Christianity is a thinking man's religion. God says, come now, let's reason together. And that's what I'm doing this morning. As I mentioned to you earlier, the three uh, competitors, as Malachi pointed out, was capitalism, uh, 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 communism, and Catholicism. In the year 1982, I think that it was, Catholicism through Pope John Paul II and capitalism through Reagan, it was on Time Magazine cover. I, sh I should have brought it here uh, uh, with me. And the cover article was The Holy Alliance. How Reagan and John Paul joined together to fight communism. Amen. And that's exactly what they did. Communism was neutralized, even the countries today that you could call somewhat communist, the way that they operate is still through some form of capitalism, all right? We don't need to get into much of that. But if the two came together, one is neutralized, then there is two now that is in this competition. This is what Malamite Markin concludes. It is not too much to say, in fact, that the chosen purpose of John Paul's pontificate, and of course every other pope that comes after him. The engine that drives his paper, grand policy, in other words, what the papacy is all about, and that determines their day-to-day, year-to-year strategies is to be the victor in that competition well on the way. My dear brothers and sisters, I thank God for his word. I thank God for the Bible. Each week we come here, we say happy Sabbath, and we wish you a happy Sabbath, share a Sabbath nugget. Now, let me now go to the word of God and let the Bible tell us, tell us about that competition that is well on its way, but more importantly, how that competition is going to end. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, John gives us a broad sweep of salvation history from the courts in heaven down through the ages down through the Protestant Reformation and down to the time in which we live. And then this is what Daniel says, um, John says in the book of Revelation chapter 12, and the dragon, that's the devil himself because that's what the Bible tells us in Revelation 12 and 9. And the dragon was wrought with the woman a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. It could be God's church, the pure woman, or the apostate church that God calls a whore. Oh yes, it's a Bible word. That's what God calls her. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of his seed, the last portion of God's church that is upon the earth. But John now goes on to describe that church and he tells us this. He says that church keeps all of the commandments of God. Oh yes, and have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, which is believing everything that God's prophets have said about him and his son Jesus and the plan of salvation. This group of people, they keep all of God's commandments and their faith is rested totally in faith Amen. on God's word. Amen. And so the dragon, the devil, is angry. So the battle, my dear brothers and sisters, 
It's over God's law. Who do we believe? The God of creation? Or do we believe the tradition of men? In a very particular way, the battle is over God's Sabbath, as I will show you in a few seconds. The Roman papacy, one of the two that are left, has now joined forces, as we showed, with capitalism in an effort to overtake the entire world. You know, our religion is not a pie-in-the-sky religion. Our religion is the reality of life. And I'm showing you this morning the reality of life, even as we live in a secular world, but more importantly, to give us the knowledge to view it in the context of God's word, in the context of his plan of salvation for human souls. Continuing, let me deal with the enemy first. This is what the enemy declares as we come into that conflict. The conflict in which we just read is based on the commandments of God. This is what the enemy says. Sunday, Sunday is our mark of authority, the church. Catholicism is above the Bible and the transference of the Sabbath is a proof of that fact. Listen to me, my Christian friends. Particularly if you don't keep the Sabbath, you need to be listening to what I'm sharing this morning. The enemy continues. This current Pope himself speaking. He says in his encyclical of about five, a little more than five years ago, the Dato C. We see this, for example, in the law of the Sabbath. On the seventh day, God rested from his work. He commanded Israel to set aside each seventh day as a day of rest, a Sabbath. No, the Bible did not command that. He says the seventh day, not a seventh day, Mr. Pope Francis. The Bible continues, in other words, he's using God's word now. But what is he using it for? Remember what Jesus warned us and his disciples. When they asked him what would be the signs of the time, he talked about deception. False prophets shall arise. Take heed that no man deceive you. If it was possible, he would deceive the even the very elect. And the abomination of desolation will be coming against the true proclamation of the gospel. And now he continues. He says, now he just quoted, misquoted rather, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. And then now he moves on. He says, on Sunday, on Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, first of all, there is no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath in God's word. It says God's Sabbath. Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. There is no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath. God gave his Sabbath at creation when there was no Jew. God gave his Sabbath before there was no sin in the world. So correction again, it's not a Jewish Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath. Then he continues. Like the Jewish Sabbath, Sunday is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God with ourselves and with others and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation. Where is that in the Bible? That Sunday is a day of the new creation. Please be praying for me uh, uh, this morning uh, because what is coming upon this world? I'm gonna share with us from the word of God what we need to do as God's people. 
Because it's only if we do that we're going to be able to stand in what is coming upon this world, what is upon us already. He continues. Sunday, I, I read that the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. Where is that in the Bible? This is why. The Bible and the Bible only has to be our faith. This is why people were murdered and, and burned alive and courted and buried alive and, and all manners of things burned to the stake because they had the Bible. The enemy hates the Bible and now we're seeing it being played out in deception of the grossest kind. My Bible tells that uh, uh, he continues rather the law of the weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day so that your ox or your donkey may have rest and the son of your manservant and stranger. He's quoting the fourth commandment. I want you to know that the enemy knows the Bible. He knows the Bible more than you and I. But as I just read, they have declared that we are above the Bible. And this is what is being played out in the time in which we live. Continues. Rest opens, okay, and be refreshed, and the stranger to be refreshed. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us a renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest centered in the Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist? It's taking the the cookie that is shared and you eat it and they tell people that it is the body of Christ and you drink the wine which is the blood of Christ but my Bible tells me that's cannibalism. <laughs> Besides, how could a mere man by taking a piece of bread and saying some mumbo jumbo uh, uh, over it makes it into the body of Christ? But this is what we're dealing with. This is what we've been told that all of us would have to be partaking of. Sunday sacredness and partaking of the Eucharist. God help me this morning. Stand with me as I share your word. And so the day of rest, rest in, the, in the Eucharist shed its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. I thought that is what the Sabbath does. Now that's what man said. Let me read to you what God said about his Sabbath. The book of Exodus chapter 20. The people of Israel had just been delivered out of Egyptian captivity where they had been for more than 400 years. And naturally being in that culture there had I come somewhat uh, climatized to it, to it and yes of course naturally they may have forgotten some things about their God and God was careful to through his servant Moses to bring back to the people's memories who he really is and what he requires of them and in the book of Exodus chapter 20 beginning with verse 3 we see the Ten Commandments, you could go there and read it for yourself. I only want to read for us this morning, in the context of what we're presenting, the Fourth Commandment. And this is what it says, beginning in verse 8, Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The only the, the, the commandment that begins with remember God's people has forgotten and so the enemy comes in and substitutes his tradition. This thing is real. There was a reason that I shared with you at the beginning. The information that I shared with you from Malachi Martin's book. Because even if you don't believe in the scripture, you don't believe in God, you have to admit that what the man said is coming to pass before our very eyes. But the Bible continues, Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, 
But the seventh day, not any day, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do, do thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. I try to share the Sabbath truth with individuals, and they tell me that every day is my Sabbath. It may be your Sabbath, but because it's not God's Sabbath. Because if you keep God's Sabbath, then you'll just be maybe loafing around all week. <laughs> because he says on the Sabbath is rest Amen. from your labors. So how every day could be your Sabbath? Some of them says Jesus is my Sabbath. But if Jesus is your Sabbath and you're yoked up with Jesus, when Jesus goes to church on, Sun, on the Sabbath, because the Bible declared that when he came out of the Mount of of uh, a temptation being tempted of the devil for 40 days and he went into the temple my bible tells me that it was on the sabbath day as his custom was so if jesus is your sabbath and you yoked up with him when he is going to the temple to the house of the lord on the sabbath day where do you go think my dear brothers and Amen. sisters this issue is beyond the days the bible continues for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the, and the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day the seventh day and hallowed it. He didn't bless the first day. But here is an institution. Here is an individual that is telling you that he, that they are above the Bible and they take the blessings. From God's Sabbath, Lord, help us. And he has transferred it to Sunday. My dear brothers and sisters, that's the nature of the struggle that we read. The final battle of the conflict of the ages. I want to give you a quote from my favorite writer, Ellen G. White, and I would suggest that if you don't have a copy of this book, The Great Controversy, that you get it. It was written more than a hundred years ago, but it pictures what is happening in the world, more than CNN, Fox News, and all of them. The picture is clearly presented more than a hundred years ago. As a matter of fact, she has been recognized that by the Smithsonian Institute as one of the 10 most famous religious writers in American history. And this is what she says in her book, The Great Controversy, page 605. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. Did she know what she was talking about? Amen. Isn't that where we are today? Amen. That the whole world is calling Man to keep Sunday, I just read an article, took a glimpse of it, actually didn't read it because I know it's going to be just foolishness. I just saw the headline. But it's a senator in the U.S. Senate from Mississippi, I think she is. She's saying that Sunday now should be made a holy day. And because it's a holy day, we shouldn't go vote on Sunday. Of course, there's another agenda tied up with that. I'm not going to get into that. But this is what we're hearing. We're hearing that because since the coronavirus came about and people have been locked up in place, that the environment is improving. Maybe we should just have a day of rest. And that day is Sunday. My dear brothers and sisters, there is cause all around the world. All around the world for men to sanctify Sunday, a day that God has not sanctified, to bring peace and to bring unity upon the earth. Think about this for a moment. It is because of Sunday sacredness throughout the ages that has brought us to the point that where we are today. If men have been keeping God's Sabbath, Amen. the way that he had enjoyed, we would not be in the condition that we are today. But now the powers of earth are saying let's institutionalize it. But my Bible tells me 
that when they do, it would bring chaos and confusion and death and despotism upon the world. As Daniel says, such as the world has never seen. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, that's where we are, that's where we're heading. She says, when the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. God is saying to you this morning, Whoever you are, whether you keep the Sabbath, and I know a number of you that are on here that do not. Praise God for the technology so much of my old friends from the other life that I have uh, listening and comment. Amen. And I say to you this morning that this is the issue. This is the conflict that we're in. This is the conflict that we're experiencing with coronavirus and God is calling you from this morning to put your trust in him. She says, while the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary, contrary to the fourth commandment, I've just showed you some of the evidence, will be an avowal of allegiance to the power that is in opposition to God. They do not make it a secret. The best way to be in opposition to something or someone and them not being aware of it, of course God is all-knowing, he is aware. But for God's people is to pretend that you are on their side. And this is what we see in Catholicism. Go back and read their history. Read the writings of the reformers of Luther and Wesley. They all point to her as the antichrist of Bible prophecy, meaning against God. She just said it with her own lips. Sunday is the mark of our authority. We are above the Bible. You can't be more antichrist than that. This is what we're dealing with, brothers and sisters. God has called me, I am sure, because I know where I've been. And for me to be before you today is a miracle. But God has called me to, to do what Paul says. In the book of Ephesians, again, he says he was called to preach boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ, the mystery of the gospel for which he is an ambassador in bonds, for which he would speak boldly as he ought to speak. And so I speak boldly the truth to you this morning. Sister White continues, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, Sunday's sacredness, received the mark of the beast, the other choosing the token of allegiance to the divine authority, received the seal of God. The book of, of Revelation the book of Revelation chapter 7 and beginning with verse 1 as John now gets a vision of the history of the church down to the time of Jesus, down to the time in which we live, he continues in Revelation chapter 7 beginning in verse 1 and he says, and after these things I saw four angels and standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind shall not blow upon the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. I want you to know that the political and cultural strifes we have around the world. I want you to know this morning that the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the tornadoes and everything that we're happening, just to put it in colloquial language, you ain't seen nothing yet because those angels are still holding back the four winds of strife, saying with a loud voice, Hurt not the sea nor the trees till we have sealed 
till we have sealed the servants of God in their forehead. Why is God holding it back? Because someone out there that is listening to me this morning, you have not accepted God's Sabbath. You may be in the valley of decision. You may be honoring and following the man of sin, thinking that Sunday sacredness is of God. But God is holding back those four angels. Amen. Because he wants you to come and to accept him. I plead with you, my dear brothers and sisters, accept him this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, as we look at the book of, of Daniel briefly, Daniel chapter 2, and the king had a dream. He couldn't remember what he dreamt. And God's captive in, in Babylon, uh, Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know them, they called a prayer meeting and asked the king's permission to, to do so, to go talk to their God. And they came back with the answer. Please go read it. I'm just going to summarize for us in the interest of time. And so Daniel came back and he interpreted the king's dream and he told the king that he dreamt of a large image about 60 feet high, six feet wide, and the head of the image was gold, and the chest and the arms were silver, and the belly was of brass, and the feet were of iron, the legs were of iron, and the feet were of iron mixed with miry clay, dirty clay, quicksand. And then Daniel says that after he sees that, that he saw a stone cut out of heaven without hands and claim and crush the image. And the interpretation, he told him that you, King Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. And after you shall come another kingdom, the kingdom of Medo and the Persians will take, overtake your kingdom. And then there would come another kingdom. It would be the Grecian Empire, and they would come and be the ruler and overtake the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. And then there would come another kingdom, the Iron Kingdom, the Iron Monarchy of Rome. But then the Bible tells us that John, that Daniel now had his own dream. And this time he saw the same information, the history of the world from the time of his captivity in Babylon to the second coming of Jesus. But God gave him the vision, the message, in the figures of beasts. The beast, the lion, representing the kingdom of Babylon. The beast of the bear, representing Medo-Persia. The beast of the leopard, representing Greece. And the nondescript beast, the iron beast. Now let me tell you what John says about that beast in the book of, of Daniel, the book of Daniel chapter seven, the book of Daniel chapter seven, John talking now about the fourth beast that he saw. He said, and beginning in, in verse seven, and after this, in the night vision, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had its great iron teeth, it devoured and break into pieces and stamped the residue with the rest of it. And it was diverse. It was different from the other beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns, talking about the Roman Empire. The history books testify that it was a cruel, a cruel entity. She stamped and subdued anything that were in her place. You dare not come against the Roman Empire. The Iron Marquis, she was the ruler of the world. Isn't that what the history has testified? What John gave to his servants? Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, the Iron Marquis of Rome. But then the Bible tells us that Rome would not be conquered by any other nation, but rather it would self destruct and become divided into ten nations. And I considered the ten horns, and before there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the four horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn 
were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. My dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know and don't take my word for it, check the history books. As the Roman Empire now began to disintegrate into these barbarian tribes, there arose a power. Out of the divided Rome, it was not coming on the scene particularly as a military power, but it was a religious power. It was a religious power that began by the Emperor Constantine in the early 4th century. Now Constantine was the emperor of, 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 of Europe, of the Roman Empire. And he had come along on the heels of Nero and Diocletian who were fighting the Christians because, as the Bible tells us, that the Christian, the, the, the work of salvation, the man Jesus was brought even into the house of the Caesars. And so here comes Constantine. And he realized, based on the history of his predecessors, that the more you persecute the Christians, the more you burn them, the more you burn them in the arenas for entertainment, the greater the gospel spread. And so Constantine came up with a strategy, if I can't beat them, then I'll join them. They were all sun worshippers. And as he claimed to join the religion of Christ he now begin to bring in all the people, all the pagan practices that was in the pagan religions, chiefly among them was sun worship and he passed a decree in AD 321 telling his empire that they should on a Sunday in respect not of the God of heaven but of the venerable son and so, my dear brothers and sisters, with Constantine, with Constantine now claiming to be a Christian, it began the makings of what we know today of the Roman church. Because what he did was amalgamated the church and the state together, gave himself the name of Pontifex Maximus, the supreme pontiff, the supreme ruler of all the churches. But what did the Bible say that this power would do? And there's a lot of history, but we only have so much time. As we go to the continue in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, this is what the Bible prophesied that she would do, or he. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. I already showed you it as it relates to the Sabbath Sunday issue, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws. She says it herself. I don't have to get more into it. History testifies to it. But thank God for his Bible, he had prophesied it so that his people would be aware and know the right choice to make. The only commandment that has to do with time is the fourth commandment. And she tells you boldly, God said the Sabbath, I'm telling you Sunday. And if you don't, this is what will happen. And there shall be given into his hand and into, until the time of the times and dividing of, of time. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and take the change times and laws. The Protestant Reformation, when men like Luther stood up at the peril of their life to preach that Jesus Christ was the only savior of the world. They were persecuted and killed. I want you to know that this morning, that that very entity is saying to you, that if you believe that, you'll be in the same position as the martyrs, as those that give their lives. Because salvation, the only way you could get salvation is through us. And the way that you do it is to keep Sunday, is to keep Sunday and take the Eucharist. That's where we are today, brothers and sisters, the book of Revelation, 
Revelation chapter 13, and I'm going to move on quickly. We have a few more minutes, but you'll get it. Revelation chapter 13 expands upon the battle. And in Revelation chapter 13, and beginning in verse 12, and it says, And he exercised all the power of the first beast. Let me back up. Let me back up John Revelation 13 and verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. We'll get to that. And upon his horns and ten crowns and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion and the dragon was like a leopard. He and had the feet of a bear and his mouth was the mouth of the lion and the dragon gave him his power. Let's think for a moment. Remember, Daniel was looking forward. He saw the lion, he saw the bear, and then he saw the leopard. Now John is looking back in the time of the Roman Empire. And what does he see? He sees the leopard, he sees the bear, and he sees the lion. And he's saying that this beast, this nation, the Bible tells us clearly, we don't have to guess, Daniel 7, 17, that these four beasts are nations and kindreds, and that these beasts are nations and kings and powers, so we don't have to guess. So now Daniel is saying that this power that he sees now arising out of the seas, the, the seas represents populated areas, the waters that thou sawest, God says, are peoples and nations and towns, Revelation 17 and verse 15. And so now John saw this power coming up of divided Europe, having all the, the qualities, the characteristics of all those beasts Amen. that he saw before. Amen. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I want you to know this morning that the Greeks were known for education. Perhaps the most educated people on the planet Earth are part of that institution. Say what you may, facts are facts. But this is why our country today, our Supreme Court is, is dominated by those of the Roman Catholic faith. And I'm not preaching against individuals. God has his people and a lot of them are going to hear messages like these and come out like the Protestant reformers did and give their lives to Jesus Christ and defy the church and obey God. The Bible said that they would. That's why I'm sharing the message because somebody this morning might be hearing this and make a decision to follow Jesus. All the pagan practices, all the pagan religious practices that were of those nations are now found in this entity, and the Bible is very clear, that the dragon, the dragon gave her his, his seat and power of authority or strength. So what is my Bible telling me? My Bible is telling me that this entity is fueled by the devil himself. As a matter of fact, in the book of Daniel chapter 8, the Bible tells us that her greatest asset in which she is overtaking the world is deception. Daniel chapter 8 and in verse, let me find it in verse uh, at 25. No, verse 24. And his power shall be mighty and not of his own power and shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and this holy people. But how are they going to do that? And through his policy, also he shall call craft, witchcraft, deception to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace. <laughs> oh yes, Iman of Iraq, let's come together and have peace. Oh yes, President Biden, let's come together and have peace. Oh yes, Vladimir Putin, let's come together and have peace. Oh, President Netanyahu, let's come together and have peace. 
My brothers and sisters, I want you to know that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in your eyes, before your eyes today. And by craft he shall prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many, and he shall stand up against the prince of princes, that he shall be broken without hand. Oh yes, you could come against every earthly king, every earthly president, but when it comes to the king of kings and lord of lords, you will be destroyed. Read an article this week, and the article was titled, Pope Francis is chaplain of the United Nations, in question marks. And this is what the article said in the very first sentence. With the recent projects, what projects? The meeting that they just had with all the richest in the world, they called it for something about compassionate capitalism. What compassionate capitalism? It's talking about consolidating all the wealth of the world. And who's going to be in charge? Pope Francis. So this writer now says, with the recent projects, Pope Francis is making it clear what it means for the Roman Catholic Church to be a sacrament in the world, in the realms of, listen to me, in the realms of global politics, education, and economy, in uniting the whole of humanity around itself. The Bible says that the whole world wanders after the beast. What are you looking for? For another beast to come up? You're not going to see anyone else. The only other thing you're going to see is when Jesus comes. But what shall we do in this environment? What shall we do? And next week I'm going to expand on this. Maybe consider it to be part two, but just going to give you a few of what God says that we need to be doing today in the book of Peter, 2 Peter, the first chapter. This is what God tells us. And according, beginning in verse 1, and according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great promises, exceeding great and precious promises that these might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so as we see the corruption intensifying, yea, even covering itself in piety, covering itself in proclaiming a message of peace. You know it's the Bible or the word of man. I choose to believe the Bible. God says what we could do is to, to claim his promises. And in the interest of time, that's going to be part two. My dear brothers and sisters, what are some of those promises? Come now, let us reason together, God says. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. What are some of those promises? Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. What are some of those promises? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against him. My dear brothers and sisters, as we come to an end of this valuable meeting. All I've shown you this morning is that what the Bible has prophesied thousands of years ago, that we will come to this moment in time in Earth's history. He shows us the powers that would be ruling. And yes, my brothers and sisters, they are ruling even now as we speak. And what should we do? Should we bow or should we do like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who told ancient Babylon, the king of ancient Babylon, that they serve a God and they would not bow down and serve 
another, another idol. And even if, even if they were cast into the fiery furnace, which they were, they would not bow down to serve him. Today, this morning, I'm pleading with all of us within my, of my voice to heed the warning of God and pray and ask him for the strength that you will bow down. I'm pleading and, and praying with the Lord. I'm not going to presumptuous and say I'm not going to bow. Only God knows, but I'm praying that God give me the strength to bow by his grace. If he could do it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if he could do it for Daniel, he could do it for you and I. We don't have to bow down to the man of sin. Amen. Amen. We don't, but in order for you to do that, we'll get into more of that next week as we do part two of Claim His Promises. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for speaking with us this morning. We thank you, dear Lord, for making it so absolutely clear to us thousands yes. of years ago yes, Jesus. exactly yes. what is happening in the world today. Yes. And now today, verily, we are on Mount Carmel, and each of us have to make a choice yes. whether we're going to serve God or we're going to bow down to Baal. Yes. Oh, like Joshua this morning, I declare, I declare that as for me and my household, we will follow the Lord by his grace yes. and I pray that everyone that is within the sound of my voice would determine in their hearts to do likewise yes. now bless us now as we continue in your Sabbath day to keep it holy yes. because you're the only one that could make a day holy and the day that you have made holy is the seventh day and not the first help us to realize the wiles of the devil and Help us to put on the whole armor of God. We'll get more into it next week. That we will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God's word is true. And if we follow him and stand on his word, then we'll be able to stand against the enemy. And then we'll experience the blessed hope that he has promised to all of us. Tune back in next week as we do part two of claim his promises. God bless and enjoy the rest of your Sabbath.